Hi there. Happy Earth Week to you. There's a lot of great things happening in California and around the world here on Earth Week. A lot of great ideas, but especially we've got some wonderful things that have hatched just for you in the past several days. Now you may remember a week ago we came to you and we showed you a fish tank and we put steelhead eggs in the, that tank. I bet you can guess what happened. And I'm not going to tell you, but you'll see in a few minutes. I'm Ethan Rotman. I coordinate the Classroom Aquarium Education Program in the San Francisco Bay Area of California for the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And I'm going to be joined again today by some of my friends as we take you on a journey so you can explore and experience fish when they're hatching from eggs and growing up into adults. In a few minutes, we're going to visit with my friend Tom, who has a fish tank with steelhead eggs. You're going to get to see what happened in the tank in the last week. We're going to zoom all the way out to the area near Sacramento, California on the American River and take a look with my friend Jason for what makes really good habitat for fish to lay eggs in and for baby fish to look in. My friend Mike is going to join us and he's going to talk about how natural pollution can impact those eggs, how we can either provide really good place for those eggs or places that are not so good. We're going to take questions from you. A lot of you wrote in last week with questions for our biologist and our fisheries biologist Derek is here with Shelly to answer those questions. So what do you say we get going? Hey Tom, are you out there? Hey, thanks for the introduction Ethan. Hi, welcome everybody. Welcome to Tank Time with Tom. Carl gave me a hatch sheet calculator. Uh, what this calculator does is it allows you to calculate the amount of days that it's going to take eggs to actually hatch into alevin. So you know what all this math and sciencey stuff means? That was a couple days ago. So guess what? We have alevin. And they're really pronounced alevin. They're a little, little baby steelhead with the egg sac still attached. And they're, and they're swimming around. It's exactly what Carl's hatch calculator estimated. It's a great way to use math and science, isn't it? So I've been really careful. There's a few really critical things. Remember we talked about the temperature, which is back there in that back corner. It says 56.3. And I mentioned before, it's a few degrees warm. So it's really about 53 degrees. But it's so important to have cold, clean water with lots of oxygen. And you may have heard the term, silt is a dirty word. Well, that's really important here. Notice how clean the gravel is. Now, if the gravel had a lot of silt in it, it would reduce the amount of oxygen in the tank. And these fish wouldn't be able to survive. In fact, they might not even hatch. In fact, there might not even be eggs if there's that much silt. And silt happens when there's a lot of runoff from so many things. It could be from fire, natural disasters. It could be from somebody making a road and not paying attention to how well it drains and then all that silt goes into the water. But these are really, really happy alevin because there's no silt. It's a nice clean gravel bed. Some of them are actually trying to hide under the rocks. You can see them back there. A lot of them are trying to hide in this corner here. So how many eggs did we receive? and how many were, will actually hatch? That's a good question. If you go to our website, there's a photo showing the eggs before we put them in the tank. Why don't you go ahead and count them and we'll see how many there are. Let us know, okay? And also, uh, the other question, which is a good one, is how many are gonna hatch? We don't know at this point, because in the wild, some are gonna die and some may die here, even though we think we have perfect conditions. You know, we don't have predators, we don't have, we have birds to come in and, and eat the fry, we don't have other fish. Um, we don't have pollution. Hard thing to answer right now, but what we'll do at the very end when we do the release is I'll put them all in a bucket and we can count them. I'll take a picture from the top and kind of like the eggs, we'll be able to see a still image of all these, of all these fry in the, uh, in the bucket and we'll be able to count them. So I think that wraps it up for today. Thank you all so much for watching. It's absolutely a blast having you here and I'm going to hang it uh, back to Ethan. So bye-bye. I'll see you next week. That is super cool, and I want to thank you, Tom, for all your hard work. When I look into a fish tank and I see eggs, it's not really very exciting, but when you can do the time lapse or you take maybe 30 minutes and squeeze it into 30 seconds, it is so cool watching those fish move around. 
But for now, what I want to do is move from here all the way out to the beginning of the Delta, up on the American River, just outside of Sacramento, where we're going to be joined by my friend Jason as we look for what those fish, if those fish were living in the wild, what would they need? Jason, can you help me out? Hi, I'm Jason, and I work here with the Department of Fish and Wildlife, and today I want to show you a couple examples of prime steelhead trout spawning ground. So steelhead, they want three critical pieces in their habitat. They need clean, shallow, rocky water. And they also like it really, really cold. So as we look over this way, we can see some examples of the environment that they do like. The water is shallow and it would rise with the rising of the tide or the level of the river. And you see these rocks here? This is what they want. They're going to move those rocks around and they're going to deposit their eggs right on top of that. About 2,000 eggs. And after about 85 days, they'll hatch out right above these rocks. And those rocks are really important because they act as protection for the fish. When a fish sees a predator, they'll sink right back down in those rocks and hide. So this is an example of a pretty good habitat. Let me show you one that's not as desirable for the steelhead. If we look at this section of the river, we could ask, is this good spawning ground? Well, as we look at it, there's not as many rocks. And this section of the river, it doesn't look as clean. And if we were to start to move this dirt around, as the tide comes down, all that silt and dirt can get on top of those eggs and suffocate them, and they would never have. That's why the steelhead like the clean spots in a river. This river habitat not only fun functions as spawning ground, but it quickly turns into a nursery for the juvenile fish. I know it might be tough to see, but right down here, there's hundreds of steelhead babies or fry. You see them swimming right above those rocks. So if they were to see a predator, they could sink down into those rocks and be protected. Super cool. I do love being out on the rivers, whether it's the American or the Russian or the Stanislaus or the Yuba, they're all great. Now, next I want to take you up to visit with my friend Mike, and he's going to share with us an activity that he likes to do that helps demonstrate why it's so important to have clean water for these baby fish and for the eggs. Mike, are you ready for us? Hello, my name is Mike Roa, and today I'm going to demonstrate an activity from Aquatic Wild called Silt, a Dirty Word. What is silt? Silt is actually very fine soil and it can wash off the land and get into streams and cause problems, which we'll talk about in a minute. Why doesn't it just stay on the land? Well, plants are the main thing that keeps the silt from washing into the water. Plants keep the silt from washing in by their roots, which holds the soil in place, and their leaves, which also uh, dampen the effect of the rain as it's falling, so it doesn't hit the ground quite as hard. And that's normally what happens in a good, healthy ecosystem. But if there's been a fire, for example, that's burned the plants away, there's nothing to protect the soil from the rain. So anything that kills or removes the plants exposes the soil to erosion, and erosion can move the silt and other soil into the stream. And now I'll show you uh, the activity. This water represents a stream, and a good healthy stream will have gravel in it, so I'm putting a few rocks in. And the fish comes along and uh, deposits its eggs in the gravel. Um, so this bead represents the egg. I'm going to put it down in the gravel. So this is a nice, healthy stream. It's got clean water. It's got nice gravel. And so we've got the egg deposited in there by the fish. Now, eggs are living things, as are the fish, of course. And living things need oxygen, just like you and I do. We get our oxygen by breathing the air. They can't do that. So they need to get their oxygen from oxygen that's dissolved in the water itself. Now the oxygen gets into the water in a variety of ways. One way is by simply diffusing from the air, moving from the air into the water. 
Another way is that aquatic plants, such as algae and plants themselves, can photosynthesize and put oxygen into the water. And a third way is splashing of water from ripples and waterfalls and such, putting bubbles into the water. All of those things add oxygen to the water, which is necessary for the eggs or for the fish to live. The young fish, which in the case of uh, salmonids like uh, steelhead and trout and salmon, are called alevins. And they live down in the gravel too for a while. So if we have good clean water, good clean gravel, not a bunch of dirt and silt in it, it's easy for the oxygen or the, uh, the dissolved oxygen in the water to get down to them. Now I'm gonna blow into the water and we're gonna pretend that my breath is water that has dissolved oxygen in it. And I'm gonna blow gently and we'll see how easy or how hard it is uh, for that dissolved oxygen carrying water to get down to the egg or to the elephant. I was blowing gently and that was very easy. So if the water is clean, the gravel is clean, it's pretty easy for water with dissolved oxygen to get down to the egg or to the elephant. But what happens if there's silt? Well, I'm gonna add some silt. So we've had a fire maybe went through, burned the plants off, and we get a lot of erosion of soil in, or maybe cattle have trampled the stream side and mud can get in. Uh, maybe they've built a road. So now we get a bunch of silt coming into the stream. And that silt, as you can see, has coated the egg and whether, whether, uh, whatever alevins might be down in the gravel. So if I now try to blow into, into the uh, water, again, this represents oxygenated water coming into the system. That was really hard. It's much harder for me to blow that uh, air, or it's representing dissolved oxygen, down to the egg. So that means that the egg or the alevin would actually smother because it couldn't get enough oxygen from the dissolved oxygen in the water. Therefore, silt is indeed a dirty word. That was super cool, huh? I love when Mike gets the mud on his face. God, I gotta love that. What I really like, though, is that that shows that it's not just big companies and corporations that cause problems, but it's people like us by doing things like dropping litter and letting garbage or other things drain into creeks, or even when we walk in a creek or let our dogs run wild, we're stirring up silt that can have a very bad negative impact on those baby fish that we like so much. So enough about that. Derek is a fisheries biologist with the Department of Fish and Wildlife. As I said, many of you sent in questions. Hey, Shelly and Derek, you ready for us? Oh, hi everyone. I'm Shelly and it's time for Ask a Biologist. Students from all over California have submitted questions and they will be answered live today by fisheries biologist Derek Acom. Derek is here and let me remind you, he's an environmental scientist with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. He gets to hike creeks, catch and count juvenile salmon and steelhead, and manage restoration projects to build salmon habitat back into our local streams. And sometimes he even gets to answer student questions from his own backyard. We are so lucky to have him. Our first question for Derek is from Rowan at Parkside Elementary. Rowan asks, why do salmon die when they get back to their home? Thanks, Shelly. Hi, Rowan. Most steelhead die after spawning. However, a small percentage do survive and return to the ocean. Salmon die after spawning because they have used up all their energy swimming upstream and producing eggs. Salmon don't eat while migrating to spawn. Their digestive system and other organs shrink and all their energy goes into making row, milt, and swimming. When they are done spawning, they have a little energy to guard their red before they die. Other animals feed on their carcasses, including other fish. The juvenile salmonids from the previous year also feed on the carcasses. These salmon carcasses are great for feeding benthic macroinvertebrates or bugs and insects in the water. This helps ensure the salmon fry have a ready supply of food when they emerge from the gravel. That is so interesting. Thanks for that great explanation. Well, Derek, we have time for one more question. Before I read it, I want to give a big shout out to all the dedicated scientists at Ohlone Elementary. The students there have sent us so many great questions. And Rasher's question is gonna be our last one for today. Rasher asks, 
Why do salmon have a yolk sac and other fish don't? Thanks for your question, Rasher. Salmonids, this includes salmon and trout, hatch from their egg with a ventral yolk sac. This is the orange bulge on their bellies. Salmonids absorb this yolk sac while they are still in the gravels. While this absorption happens, they finish developing their fins and mouths. They build the muscle strength they will soon need when they emerge from the gravels and swim in open water. The yolk sac provides the nutrition and energy they need to grow and survive. Once their yolk sac is gone, they need to swim and catch their food in the stream. Other fish absorb their yolk sac while they are still in the egg. When these other fish hatch, they are ready to start swimming and eating right away. Now back to you, Shelly. That is fascinating. Thanks so much, Derek. This has been really fun and really informative. Back to you, Ethan. When I grow up, I want to be as smart as Derek is. That's pretty much it for this week. We are going to be coming back to you next week and we're going to look at those fish again to see how much they change over a week. We've seen how much they changed from last week. I wonder what they're going to look like next week. In between now and then, you can visit those fish anytime you want from the comfort of your home. There's a link on the webpage that shows you where you can access that camera. We also have the broadcast from last week that you can watch and you can share this with any of your friends. Here's my challenge for you. What can you do in the next day or two days or week that's going to help make the earth a better place? What can you do that is going to make habitat for fish and other animals a little cleaner, a little healthier? It may be something small like just walking around your yard and picking up the litter to make sure it doesn't wash down your driveway or off your lawn and into the storm drain. Maybe you could launch a whole new online campaign notifying your neighbors of issues that are important. It doesn't matter what you do, you have tremendous power. Let's all work together to make this a better planet. Happy Earth Day. Until next time, this is Ethan Rotman. See you soon.